there was a time where it wasn't like this is kind of a choice. Like this actually is a choice. But there was a time where I really didn't have a choice. Like me and my parents, we didn't get along at all. We didn't get along at all. And um, we used to bump heads, and it got, you know, they would come at me a certain way, and I would fold, and then I'd come back ten times harder the next time, and then they would come back ten times harder, and it's just like exponentially grow. And then one time we just crossed that line where, you know, no return, and um, we, from there we didn't talk to each other. And everything I did, I would get kicked out the house. So I just leave the house like every single day, and I basically became like homeless. I would go, I just go to sleep in the park, and then come home, and then like, where were you at? And I was like, I, I gotta feel like coming home and, and being talked shit to like every fucking day. So, and then they would try to find like little ways, like what were you doing outside, and like try to get arguments over that. And then once they started doing that, I would just leave. And then eventually. We got in another fight, and I said, I'm leaving for good. I, and to be honest with you, I got kicked out. I got kicked out when my father tried to fight me, tried to put hands on me. And I was gonna knock his ass out, but I left. And I left, it was cold as hell. I remember not having a jacket. I, I didn't have a jacket. I had like some sweatpants. And this was like the first time I ever been out, like out, 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 without the right, like proper anything. And I, I f almost fucking froze to death. Like I almost froze to death, and I was thinking about jumping off a bridge. Like I literally walked back and forth. Like contemplating jumping off the bridge. I was like, if I get cold enough and I don't feel like I'm gonna survive, I'm gonna jump off this fucking bridge. And then I came back home that day and they were like, we need to see therapy. Like, I don't need to see therapy. You motherfuckers need to see therapy. You don't fucking kick somebody out in the cold and don't go fucking looking for him. So, I, so after that, I, I, I told him, I was like, I don't ever wanna talk to you again. I don't wanna speak to you again. I don't care if I die, I don't care if you die. I don't give a fuck. And after that, I became homeless. I, went to, I, I, I was in Missouri. We went to the Missouri homeless shelter. Uh, I stayed. I stayed there overnight, and I fucking left. I packed my shit. I left, and I ended up in a homeless shelter. I went through the homeless shelter thingy. The first day was it was brutal to some people, but it, it wasn't brutal. I just I was just happy I wasn't on the street. But that was brutal, man. Like being cold with nothing is fucking brutal. I don't know how to explain it. It's just you wanna you, you wanna you wanna just kill yourself. Like that's it. Like. You either you either gonna go to jail so you can have a place to, to stay at and get something to eat, or you're gonna kill yourself. That's it. But you literally have nobody that's gonna help. I've I've been homeless now, going on seven years. In December, I'll be on the street seven years. I was a sand hog, which is a tunnel worker in the city of New York, and I got I got sick. I have a cardiac condition, and I have some breathing problems, and I've been fighting for my disability, which I've been denied three times already. Um, I used to be a father of three beautiful girls and a husband to a wife that I lost through all of this. Uh, I had a home at one time. This isn't what I've, I've always been like. And uh, I've been out here for seven years just trying to you know, get back up on my feet. And it's very difficult. You know, the only reason I've survived is because of the, the generosity of people in the city of New York who helped you know, uh, give, have given me some money, given me food, to help, help me look out, get me some clothes sometimes. So sometimes I get somebody to get me a room and no place to stay. Um, like I said, I've been out here for seven years and I've lost everything I had for it. I worked 17 years and now I'm out here fighting for my disability, something that I think I should just be given since I've been taken out of work by two different doctors. And, um, you know, they're denying me saying that because I have a work history, I'm retrainable. But due to my cardiac condition, I, there's not really much I can do. I was raised out here on the street since I uh, came out here at three years old. Been out here since I was 12. And um, I have four children. Lost my children. And I'm just out here. Um, I use drugs a lot of time. Been out here working for a really long time. Try to change my life. So, um, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, my life been hard out here, really, really hard. I wouldn't wish drugs on my worst enemy. It's been tore my life totally up, totally down. My name is Angel Dawn DeCorey Pierce. Um, my main name is DeCorey, but okay, I married this guy. I went to prison right and I got out and met this guy and we got hooked up. And um, I married him just because to make my family mad, right? 
Damn. He took me to Las Vegas. On our honeymoon, I got hooked on heroin. Okay, he, he, put, he wanted me to try. I was scared of it. Um, not that I'm blaming him, but God, I make this short. But um, okay, so once I started the heroin, then he decided that I was a commodity, right? And he put me out on the streets to work. I stayed with him seven years, right? And then um, I had some trouble in Indiana. I had to go back. You know, I went home and I had to do some time. I had a year to pay for that. And that year, you know, I realized it's bad. So when I got out, I left him. I came back here and um. I left him and um because I figured I'd rather be on the streets and do this than what I was doing, you know, because this man didn't get to just him, right. So I'm out here, you know, I'm paying. I used to be a heroin junkie for God, five years. And um I don't do heroin no more. I've been clean since I since I left him, I've been with this man. And he's good to me, he's sweet, you know, and um we're trying out streets, but every day we gotta survive, we got here in pan, you know, and you know, it's, I don't do hard drugs, but yes, I drink beer and I'll smoke some meat. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, life's full challenges, right? You know, it's going to survive and go on and become everything, you know? I mean, North, will you stop with that? Oh, okay. Have you uh, have you been to Dia? Yeah, uh, Beacon. Dia Beacon? Have you been up there? Yes. How'd you like it? I mean, I love it. You know, I love Flavin. I love Solowit. And oh. it's filled with Flavin and Solowit, so. Apparently and Judge. The, the guy who runs Borders Books, or one of the, I think it went out of business, or Barnes & Noble, or one of those guys, is the uh, funder. Bord Borders went, went out of business. Barnes & Noble. No, Barnes & Noble didn't go out of business. Borders. I think Borders it's the guy, did. Yeah, the guy from Barnes & Noble. Oh. Uh, yeah. What about him? Well, Borders became a very minimal project, and uh, Barnes & Noble is still happening, but I believe that he funded Dia Beacon. Oh, okay. And uh, it was like a cereal producing. That was like God, a cereal a factory. Cereal factory or something. Yeah. It was um, Quaker Quaker Oats. It was run by Quakers when the Quaker Oats was really made by Quakers. Uh huh. No, I don't. I don't know what it, it used to be like Nabisco or something like that. I think Nabisco is like an '80s company. Kellogg's or yeah. Well, the, Nabisco's still around. But what? It, yeah. So, Dia Beacon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Dia Beacon's <laughs> awesome, man. I love uh, all I, the... I haven't been there yet. I've been wanting to go there. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. Every, every, all the, the guys I like. Judd, Flavin, Salawit. Beautiful pieces. Carl Andre, Richard Serra. Right. Just all like minimal masters. For some reason, our world humor always segues into cereal box humor. I'm not sure why. But this has happened several times. It's a very strange phenomenon. Oh. Um, so, uh, what is the city we're going to? Where uh, Frank Stella Studio? What's it called? Uh, fucking motherfucker. Uh, motherfucker. Uh, here we go. Where are we going? Navigation. Destination. Rock Tavern, New York. Okay. Yeah, let's see how far we are. Okay, uh, hi, my name is uh, St. Andrea. I'm a Shamatina. I'm Mexican American. I'm 39 years old. I have five children that were taken by my mother. I wasn't drug addicted. I wasn't an alcoholic. I was abused by my mother at a young age, at the age of 11 years old. We lived in Hollywood. She told me that once I became an adult, I would be beautiful, educated, intelligent, and I would have children. And I would probably be married one day, and my husband, my husband would probably, probably be a, a somebody that would, that would be responsible and obligated. But even if not, I would take care of my own responsibilities, I would take care of my own obligations, and I would take care of my own children. Once I became an adult, I would move on with my life. But she didn't tell me that I would be abused and neglected for several years of my lifetime. Throughout my entire life, I was abused, neglected. I was obligated to stay in a marriage that that was without security, without stability. Uh, I had no money. I was in on welfare for maybe more than 20 years. Um, I got married at a young age. I was about 15 years old. Um, 
not legally, not by the church, which I'm a Catholic. I've been a Catholic Christian for several years since I've been, since the day of birth. Um, I really returned to my Catholic religion at the age of 30, 36 of age. I started praying again. I started praying to saints. I started praying to God and Jesus Christ, thanking God and being grateful for not being abused and neglected any longer. Um, I go to the Precious Blood Catholic Church on Sundays and Saturdays. I haven't went for quite some time because I was in Hollywood in Narcotics Anonymous. I finally got to see what stability is and what security is and what freedom really is without being abused and neglected. And I found a sense of stability and I found a sense of freedom within my own, within my own spirit, within my own heart, within my own body, my own mind. I found out about a lot of things in life that I didn't know. I have always had a, a sense of a sense of stability in my own way. I always tried to stay, stay clean and sober. I never was really a drug addict or an alcoholic, like I said. I was influenced to think that methamphetamine was a way that I stayed fair-skinned, which I was very fair, very long black hair, black hair, very uh, porcelain pearly white skin, which I thought it was amazing and a beautiful thing, like a fairy tale, like a princess, like Snow White. I always thought I was like Cinderella, like Snow White, which I would wake up one day and I would be at home with my mother and my family and my children one day. Christmases would pass by and I had no money. I had no family there and I would feel really depressed and really stressed out, but I never ran to drugs. I never ran to alcohol. There was some episodes in some situations where I lived on 47th and Avalon in South Los Angeles with a family. Her name was Celia Lopez and Gerardo Solorzano. They were Mexican, which they claimed to say they were Mexican, which I had a, a thought in my mind, in my heart, that maybe they were a different nationality, maybe I wasn't sure. But I had known them for several years since I was very young. My mother planned this life out for me, which I, I'm hurt. I did not offend her in any way. I just looked at her with sadness and with my fair skin face and my little fair body and my little fairy tale life, which it no longer was a fairy tale any longer. It became a reality, it became a nightmare. I was being abused, hit with broomsticks. I was being punched, my hair was being pulled. I was having child every seven years or so on certain holidays, Valentine's Day, and the dates were incorrect. I was having children on certain holidays, like I said. Uh, my mother believes in saints. We're Mexican-American. Uh, I never found out if she was from East LA, Compton, South Central, or wherever. My father is a well-known gang member in East Los Angeles. Uh, I never became a hardcore chola or anything like that or any gang member. Uh, I always wanted an education, I always wanted a job, I always wanted to move on with my life, with my children. I was obligated, I was told that I would marry an American who would be white. Who would be American and who would be white, his name would be Robert something. He would go by different last names and I would find out maybe at 36 or 37 that he really was married and he had several children. And, and I, uh, I had forgot about that. Part of my life which I never married him I never got to meet him until years later and I really didn't care anymore about it I was still obligated to the marriage not really that not that obligated like in the beginning we were we turned into friends we had a good friendship going which I thought because of you know my personality I'm very sensitive I'm very bashful and shy and very friendly and I'm really picky about who I pick to be my friends I'm not a backstabber I'm not a two-faced and I'm not a backslider. When I say something, I mean it. I stick to my guns and I stick to my word. When I say I love you or I'll be your friend until the end, I mean it. Until, until, until you betray me or you backstab me. And I stick things out all the way until it's completely done. And I love my children. I did not sell them. I was raped and I was almost killed years ago in South Central. But I don't know how I lived and I recovered somehow. And I thank the Lord Jesus Christ that I lived and I'm still alive today and I have my beautiful children that I still love. They went up for a legal adoption. And I'm still working on it through Narcotics Anonymous and I'm just taking a breather and a break. And I needed to get out of Hollywood for a while because I felt ashamed in a way. They're all rich people and I'm poor. And I'm on welfare and food stamps and I got robbed more than once. And I told my mother this and my sisters and I just still pray to Jesus and I still believe in God. I still believe in the Catholic religion. And I just returned back to the Catholic Church a few days ago. And I feel a lot better within my heart, within my soul, within my spirit, within my life, and within my children's safety. And I thank you for listening. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is James. I'm homeless right now. 
Uh, I'm a diabetic. I had a problem with my foot. I lost one of my toes. I had one of my toes amputated. I've been out of work for a while. I lost my apartment. And uh, I come out here and, and I ask people to see if they can help me so I can afford a, a little bit of money so I can stay in some guy's apartment at night. Uh, life right now is okay. It's not what it's supposed to be. But uh, little by little, I'm getting my life back. And uh, my foot is healing. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I'm a college educated person. I got two college degrees and I have no income. Uh, people, people over here are helping me uh, get a little bit of money so I'm able to at least eat and have a place to stay at night. Uh, I have no other means of, of making money. I lost my apartment. Uh, I lost my girl. I, my kids are in California. But uh, I'm still I'm still pushing to, to succeed in this world. Uh, I'm 52 years old. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> but uh, this is life. I can't, okay, it's not fair when everybody thinks it's all my fault. I mean, you know, Claudia stood by me for years. I mean, no doubt about it. Now look at all these guys. I mean, they won't fucking man up to the fact that they're an asshole. I mean, jump on a fucking line. You're an asshole. You know it. They know it. Everybody fucking knows it. So I'm an asshole too. I mean, me, absolutely. Bruce, no doubt about it. Claudia stood by me for years. Way more than, than anybody else would. So I don't want people to form the opinion that it's all her fault. You know, my, my other friend says that. It's bullshit, it's, it's my fault. It's a shared fault. It was just what is, what is, you know? But I mean, I'm not gonna fucking stand here and pretend like I'm the good guy and I was perfect and, and Claudia was just such a bitch. Well, that's not fucking true. I was an asshole. I was born an asshole. I've been an asshole my whole life and I've got it down pat. Count on it, so believe me, I can at least I'll man up I'll toe the line, I admit it, and I take responsibility for what I did, good and bad. Not to say that I don't have my strong points. My grandchildren, my boys, um, that's my strong point. I stand by them, I get in front of a train. Done nothing wrong to them, with them, and I won't. And that's why I'm taking the road that I'm taking now because I'm looking at them. It would behoove me to be the jerk, do all this shit right now, take what I could get, but I don't want to do that. I want them to have a platform, a springboard, to have a good shot. And so, I can do it, I can make it, we're good. You know, it's been a, it's been a long road here uh, in Los Angeles. I spent most of my life now in Los Angeles, and uh, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of different kinds of careers, a lot of different jobs. Um, and it's been a... You know, decent city to me. Um, I've had some, you know, some success with some things. I've had some failures. Um, the failures have been painful uh, to the point of, you know, kind of paralyzing um, at times. I think I put my heart into things. I think I put. Um, my best into things, and, and I've had a lot of disappointment around different projects. So it's, you know, it's uh, it's tough sometimes to to believe in yourself after those kind of uh, highs and lows. Those highs and lows are not very, uh, they're not they're not easy. They're not easy. They're tough. Um, I like the highs. <laughs> I've enjoyed some of those. Uh, you know, I've taught myself a lot of things. Most of the things that I've been able to do, I've been self-taught. Um, I've had some good coaches along the way, but uh, a lot of it's self-taught. You know, I think I have a lot of great friends, and uh, they've carried me through uh, when things have been tough. 
and you know, I've had some friends that have fallen away, I've had some friends that have passed away, some friends that have Thank you. disappointed me and fallen short. And um, so I'd say, you know, my great friends I can count on one hand. Okay, hi, my name is Steve, and um, my last name is Gold. I was born in New York, and I grew up in Encino which is a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, I'm 54 years old, and how I, kind of an interesting story how I ended up here at the uh, Los Feliz Post Office. Um, <clears throat> I had a great, it was brought up great. Uh, my parents were terrific. They couldn't have been better parents. Um, my dad was successful, was in the music business, and my mom was like your regular homemaker. I just decided to do things my way, not their way, and I paid a very dear price for it. Uh, the good news is, though, that I'm still alive. Most people that have undergone what I've done and how I've lived my life are either in jail or, or dead. I got into drug addiction when I was early, early teens. Um, I ended up in rehab. I ended up working for the rehab that I went to, actually. Ended up in Hawaii. Things couldn't be better. I had the director say to me, look, you're going to have a great, great career. You're going to be here. I'm going to send you to school. I'm going to do everything for you. And my answer to that was to go out and get loaded. So both my parents died when I was in jail. And what I'm getting at here is that no matter what, no matter what, your parents are your best friends. They may not be the most perfect people in the world, but they're not going to tell you to do something or most of them are not going to tell you to do something that's just going to hurt you. Uh, you can't blame things on other people or, or your environment. I made my decisions and I paid a very high price for it. And uh, the reason why I'm opening the door at the post office during Christmas time is because I thank God I still have a car. The uh, last car I had I sold for one-tenth what it was worth because I wanted to get loaded. Because you just can't run away. I have a, I have a 22 year old daughter who, whose mother passed away from drugs, and that didn't even teach me anything. So, you know, what what I kind of a profile I'm trying to explain, I guess, is that I I've spent 40 of my 54 years running away from I don't really even know what running away from reality, running away from responsibilities, running away from myself and, and in retrospect there's really nothing to run away from um, I wasn't going to be a big music producer like my father I just wasn't talented like that but I could have done something I could have done something that I was proud of when I went to Hawaii I ended up teaching scuba diving and I, and I had to do it I had to ruin myself one more time so I think I've made some type of commitment to myself, um, not to continue to do this. I don't know if the camera can see this, but I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to try. This is what I look like when I, just to give you kind of a perspective into, uh, into what I was, what I looked like when I was, uh, when I got back from Hawaii. Um, I weighed 50 pounds more, I was healthy. You know, I just, uh, it's not OP me or for me, it's just that I, I really believe that uh, we're a product of our own decisions. And decisions that we make in life, we pay for. And the price tag that we pay is sometimes very high. Sometimes people pay with their lives, sometimes people pay with terrific illness. The thing is, is that I've learned that God really presents himself through people. My dad used to say that he wanted to have a hot dog with his friend and a steak by himself. I couldn't understand that. Now I do. I do. I do understand what he meant by that. I always used to get mad at him because I always thought that here's a guy that went to school and taught economics and statistics and ended up producing Johnny Mathis records. What did I do? I was sitting on the street and, 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 and panhandling money at, at, at 20 got me jobs and this and that and the other thing and it 
None of it was good enough. None of it was good enough at all. I've flown off of cliffs. On the other end of the coin, I have a beautiful child who's the light of my life. And I still have some time left to make a living amends. So uh, it's Christmas. It's, we, we went through the, the end of the Mayan calendar, which is going <laughs> to which they, I, I believe is always going to start all over again. So I, I believe that I have a new lease on life. I'm still breathing. Life is good. Uh, I'm able to share myself with somebody else. Uh, I hope I didn't uh, wear anybody out or create a picture of gloom. I created a picture of gloom because that's what I wanted to create. Um, I like to see... The, Look, I look around and I look at what a beautiful place I'm in. And I live in the United States and I'm not being shot at that uh, I don't live in Fallujah or, or Afghanistan. Uh, people are basically nice. People have helped me. When I have an opportunity to help people, I do the same thing too. And it feels good. And it feels good to have just another opportunity of being a human being. The, the thing that or, or the emotion or the feeling that is most most detrimental and, and, and the hardest one to deal with is loneliness. I've created this wall around me where I can't let anybody know the truth because God forbid they know who I really am who would want to be my friend. Well, first I got to be my own friend. If I'm my own friend first then maybe, maybe, just maybe I have a chance of some recovery to it. There's different types of recovery. There's 12 steps, there's this, there's that. I, I've seen people that have stayed clean for a long time and, and, and relapse. I, I believe that it's just not for me. Chemicals are just not for me. Unfortunately, getting back to it though, that people here are, for some reason, the police and the people here at the post office allow me to stand here and open the door. I don't ask people for change. To be able to make $30, $40 a day just doing that is a blessing in itself. I can eat and I can say hello to people. And, and really better than the money is that people look at me in the eye and they say hello. And that sure is better than sitting behind a dumpster uh, by myself doing what I need to do to uh, make it through the day. Um, but other than that, I loved living in Hawaii. It's a beautiful, tranquil place to live. Uh, I was able to actually make friends there and, and, and people accepted me and I didn't have to lie. I didn't have to become someone that I wasn't. I was just Steve Gold and uh, that's who I was. I wasn't, uh, oh there's Steve, Jackal's son. And, and, or, or, so I was just Steve and, and nobody knew about my Nobody knew that I drove a car over the cliff when I was 17 years old and almost killed myself. Nobody knew that I took checks from my, from my parents. I think I stole $100 in checks from my parents. My dad let me sit in jail for two days. Needless to say, I never did that again. But uh, shame, guilt, and remorse, those things will hurt anybody. And, and uh, I believe that if people want to start over or, or, or just be a good person. I think we all have a lot of good in us. And I believe that I have a lot of good in me and I believe that there's a lot of good in you. I just look forward to being part of the human race.